Hi, welcome to video 15. Today we're going to be looking at molecular geometry of covalent compounds and how that affects their overall polarity. So, as you may recall, when atoms uh, bond in a covalent bond, they're sharing electrons. And those electrons that are being shared, those valence electrons that are being shared, have to orbit around the nuclei of both atoms. Now, how much time they spend around each particular nucleus depends on the electronegativity of the atoms. And remember, electronegativity is the resistance of an atom to share its valence electrons in a covalent bond. So the more electronegative that you are, the more resistant, the more that you want to keep the electrons near you, all right, and the less you want to actually share them with the other nucleus. So uh, if you also recall electronegativity, uh, it's highest at uh, fluorine, lowest at francium, and the most electronegative elements are going to be fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, then following by chlorine, and other atoms uh, as well. All right? So, if you're an atom that is very electronegative, i.e. that you do not want to share your electrons, you're going to bring that electron density closer to you and become electron rich. That electron richness is going to make you partially uh, negative. And that's what we have uh, here is this symbol uh, that represents partial negative. All right? The other atom that was sharing those electrons that this more electronegative element has pulled closer to itself is going to lose some of that electron density, some of that electron charge, and therefore is going to become slightly partially positive. All right? And that's the symbol again that we have on this side of here. This causes a bond to be polarized or to have polarity or to create what is called a bond dipole. A dipole just represents something that has two poles, one of positive charge, one of negative charge. Now, these uh, partial positive and negative charges are not full charges. They're not the same charge as transferring electrons, but it does represent that there is difference in how those electrons are being shared. Now, the bond polarity then is something that occurs when there is uneven sharing of electrons between atoms that have different electronegativities. That causes the bond dipoles, which I just mentioned. And so let's look at how that happens here. If I have an atom, such uh, a molecule such as hydrogen chloride, you can see that there is a bond being shared between the hydrogen and the chlorine. That's a pair of electrons. You can see it on the next image right next to it as the, the lone pair, that red pair of electrons that I have there. Now, it is important to notice that since chlorine is more electronegative, it is going to push the electrons or pull the electrons closer to itself. By doing that, it becomes partially negative because the electrons are spending more time around uh, the chlorine atom. So in fact, if we were to draw the shape of the electron density, the electron density would look something like that, heavier towards the chlorine atom. And so that gives chlorine a delta negative charge, and it gives the hydrogen, which is now slightly electron deficient, a delta positive charge. And this is what we call a bond dipole. A bond dipole is then just I'm just going to draw it here. That representation of the charges, all right, the partial charges that exist when there's uneven sharing. We normally tend to represent it with an arrow pointing in the direction of where the electrons are richer, all right? And so if that helps you think about it, it almost looks like at the beginning we have a little almost like a plus, and that is where we're going to have the partially ne uh, positive uh, atom, and then pointing towards a more negative one. On the image underneath, you have a molecule of chlorine. A molecule of chlorine is formed by two atoms of the same element, and therefore they have the same electronegativity. So the electrons here at the center 
actually are evenly distributed, all right? And so the electron density does not, sh does not um, change. And so that bond is a non-polar a, a non bond, all right? And so the electron density is relatively even, and so we would see that the electron density would just look symmetrical, all right? And therefore, we have no polarity, all right? Now, this is fine and great when you have molecules that only have one bond, but if you have a molecule that have multiple bonds to multiple atoms, you have to add together all of those bond polarities in order to get the molecular polarity. The molecular polarity, uh, in a more mathematical way, is the vector sum of all the bond polarities. We are just going to look at it in a very straightforward fashion, but you have to consider the geometry. Like anything that is a vector, direction is very important, and so we're going to see whether things cancel out or they don't cancel out. So, let me just pull this a little bit higher so you can see it a little bit better. All right? For molecular polarity, it's then going to be those bond dipoles adding together. If, when you add them together, they result in no net dipole, i.e., you end up in the same place that you started, that's going to be a nonpolar molecule. And nonpolar molecules are normally very, very symmetrical and have bonds that can oppose each other. A molecule that has some type of symmetry sometimes but doesn't have bonds that oppose each other or at the end when you add the bond dipoles they don't oppose each other or you end up with some dipoles then you're going to have a polar molecule. Let me explain this a little bit further with the examples. If we have here carbon disulfide and you can see that carbon disulfide is a linear molecule, first of all, all right? So we can see that the bonds are opposing each other, so that's our first clue. And because the bond dipoles, I've already bo uh, drawn the bond dipoles, are pointing in opposite directions, but they have the same size and they are the same, uh, they're in opposite directions. When you put them together, if you were going to add them, when you add vectors, you start with the, the head of one, Okay, the starting point of one goes to where the other one ended. When we do that, if we were to carry that around, we end up in the same place. There is no net uh, dipole that is generated. It cancels out. All right. The most important thing is you can probably see it visually that, in fact, they can cancel each other out. It doesn't matter which way you were to look at them. All right. Uh, they do end up canceling out. On the case of sulfur dioxide, which is a bent molecule, and the geometry is going to be very important in this, you see that we have, again, two bonds between oxygen and sulfur. But in this particular case, because of the geometry, all right, the left and right parts or components of those arrows of di dipoles that I have drawn in there may be able to cancel each other out, but there's an up and down component. There's just a down component, no up, to cancel it out. So when we were to add those, if I were to move this, if I were to move, oh, yeah, come on. Um, that's not letting me pick it up. All right. If I were to move the other one then, and I put it over here, we end up with a resultant line, all right, that connects those two. And so we didn't end up with zero. And the fact that you end up with a resultant tells you that you have a molecular dipole, and so you have molecular polarity, all right? So let's look at how that influences. What happens if you have polarity? Well, a molecule that has polarity, all right, is going to have stronger intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces are the attractive forces between the molecules of the compound, all right? And they basically are the things, are the forces that keep the molecules close enough to each other to have that substance become a liquid or a solid. If it wasn't for intermolecular forces, all compounds or most compounds would be gases or gases because there would be no attraction between the particles. All right? But instead, when you have intermolecular forces, you're going to 
be able to change physical states. Polar molecules tend to have much stronger intermolecular forces, IMFs, than nonpolar molecules. And therefore, polar molecules will have higher boiling points and higher melting points. And a very clear example of that is uh, the difference between methane and uh, water. All right, these are two molecules that have about the same size. They have about the same molecular mass. Methane has a molecular mass of 16. Water has a molecular mass of 18. And yet, their polarity is vastly different. All right? Methane, for example, is a tetrahedral molecule, while water is a bent molecule. Because of the particular distribution of the dipoles, if we were to draw all the different dipoles here, and if we were to think about it in three dimensions, which is why we were doing work with our models the other day, we find that all of those end up canceling each other out, and so we end up with a molecule that is nonpolar. In the case of water, we also have dipoles, and the dipoles are large and point downwards, and so they add up together and they do not cancel out. And so we end up with a molecule again, in this case, that is polar. The difference of polarity between methane and water it is what is responsible for the vast difference in their boiling points. Water has a boiling point that is over 250 degrees higher than that of methane. Now, water is very special. It's not only polar, it has a special type of polarity that creates a very strong intermolecular force called hydrogen bonding, all right? But the idea of that, of that is caused by the polarity of water, all right, uh, makes it very uh, important. The property of the physical state is determined, at a particular temperature, is determined by the intermolecular forces, all right? So it is a very important um, function. And so what I want you to try to uh, try out for next week, all right, is to, in fact, complete um, or, yeah, complete the, the, the whole set of finding the molecular geometry. For that, you need to do the Lewis dot structure. Then you're going to find the bond polarities of each one of the bonds in each one of the molecules. And tell me what if the molecule is overall polar or nonpolar. So finding bond polarity is just looking at the two atoms and saying, do they have the same electronegativity or do they have different electronegativities? If they have different electronegativities, you know then that the bond will be polar. Molecular polarity is bringing everything together and finding from the geometry, all right, whether these are going to be um, polar or not. And so give that a try and I'll see you in class next time. All right, bye-bye.